got so quiet. Hello. <laughs> welcome, everybody. Uh, good evening, and welcome to Civic Camp Citizens Mayoral Forum. My name is Peter Rashog, and I'm co chairperson for our 2013 Civic Camp Municipal Election Forums Initiative. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone here tonight, the public, the candidates, the media, and all the hardworking uh, uh, media staff uh, televising this. Uh, we, excuse me for a second. Um, it's really wonderful to see so many Calgarians engaged and eager to learn more about the candidates as well as the issues that shape our city. Our moderator for this evening will be out here in a few moments to fill you in on details about tonight's proceedings. However, I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight some of the wonderful people that have helped our forum series become such a success. Over the past eight months, dozens of volunteers from across the city have contributed their time and efforts to help us fulfill a very ambitious plan to hold 18, that's right, 18 Citizens Forum events in just 22 days. And, and we're almost there. I think tonight's 12, so we're two-thirds of the way through. It's very exciting. And that's just for the forums events. There have been many more volunteers that have been working hard to bring you our own Civic Camp Citizen's Guide, which you can pick up on the table as you enter there, uh, as well as multiple other initiatives relating to disclosure of campaign finance from 2010, as well as our web-based disclosure uh, 2013 initiative for candidates in our efforts to increase transparency and fairness in campaigns and advocating for campaign finance reform. Volunteers are the lifeblood of what Civic Camp does. They are Calgarians just like you, coming from all walks of life, but with a common purpose and passion to work collaboratively, collaboratively in making a city, uh, a great city even greater. From our support crew, to the logistics leads, to the skilled moderators we've had come forward, we're very proud of our volunteer teams that have worked hard to bring everything together for this forum series. There are simply too many names to list, but I will take this opportunity to highlight a few. Emma Brager, she's here in the front in the green. She's been integral to the success of our logistics team. She was, she was with us in 2010 when we started this initiative three years ago and, and did 15 events. DJ Kelly, uh, he's here as well. Uh, he's been a member for our 2010 team as well as this one, facilitating event format, moderator roles in our communications. And last but not least, the Sonny to my share, the Han Solo to my Chewbacca, the Batman to my Robin and co-chair for our forum series, the hardest working man in show business. Jeremy Zhao, right here in the front. He's worked extremely hard. Without these folks, we simply couldn't have had this happen, and there are 20 or 30 other people that I, I again, don't have the time to mention. So thank you for, to all the volunteers for their dedication, their work ethic, their humor, and their adaptability in making this such a success. I now, ladies and gentlemen, would like to invite Connor Brown to the stage. Connor is the Vice President External for the University of Calgary Students' Union that are our co-sponsors for this evening's forum. Thank you, Peter. Uh, first off, I'd like to say, uh, thank Civic Camp for partnering with us here tonight. Otherwise, this event would not at all be possible. So thank you, Civic Camp. Now, yeah, give them a quick round of applause there. I'd also like to thank all the candidates you see before you for coming out here tonight and give them a round of applause as well. Thank you for being here as well. I'd also like to thank uh, all the students who came out here tonight. You're, uh, you're hiding out there, but I know you're here and, and thank you for being here and supporting everything that happens in your city. The Students' Union holds these forums because we really want students to get engaged in municipal government and recognize that it affects them. We know that if young people get engaged in this process early on, that they are likely to be voters for the rest of their lives. I'd also like uh, students as well as everyone else in the audience to know that there have been some rule changes around voting eligibility over the past year uh, in terms of uh, the address on your license. If the address on your identification does not match where you currently live, then please be sure to bring a piece of mail from an official source with your name and current address on it. That's what I'll be doing. I'm actually a BC native myself, and uh, I've lived here for the past four years, so I'll definitely be bringing my uh, driver's uh, vehicle registration along with me. 
For everyone in the campus community, I'd also like to let you know about the advanced polls that are happening in uh, McEwen Student Center South Courtyard. Uh, right next to campus security and the student union offices and those are happening from October 9th to 16th from noon to 7 p.m. except for uh, on the 16th when they will be closed at 5. The polls are multi constituency so whichever ward you live in you can all vote you can vote there for all races. For anyone who misses the advanced polls election day is on October 21st and check the city website for your polling location. We are also really excited to be hosting another event on Wednesday night. And for the first time in 30 years, Ward 1 is an open race. The event is at the same time and same place, so hopefully we will see you all there. Thanks again for coming out tonight, and I'll ha now hand it off to David Gray, the host of CBC's The Eye Opener, our moderator for tonight's event. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for inviting me here. Thanks to all the candidates for getting here. I know some of you came from a long way to be here today. Others just drove up the road, but it's fantastic that you all showed up. It's wonderful. Um, I'm going to thank a few people, uh, but really we just want to get to it here because it's Monday night, and they chose a morning show guy to host this because they know I have to get up early. So my job is to watch this clock. You help me out with it and keep these people to time as they answer their questions. I'm going to go through the format for you. But first, a couple of quick thank yous. First, thanks to Civic Camp. If you don't know what Civic Camp is, it's kind of like band camp for ex-poli sci majors. But it's, a, it's actually a very cool thing that happens in this city. It's a nonpartisan public, or public advocacy group. If you want to know more, just check out their website, all right? And you can learn a lot about it from, or a lot about the site from their website. You can just join up and help out and run things like this. They were the first group to put together all of these candidate forums. They pulled it off in 2010 in every ward across the city. It looks like they're going to do it again this time. And they do a lot for democracy in this town, so they deserve the recognition. <laughs> Thanks to our partner and host tonight, the University of Calgary Students Union. Keep your applause to the end, so we'll go through these quickly. Calgary Sound and Rentals and the Calgary Roadrunners for providing equipment for tonight's forum. On the cheap, I'm told. Our media partners, talking about on the cheap, CBC Calgary, uh, CJSW, Fast Forward Weekly, and Metro Calgary. Thanks to the Calgary Association of Parents and School Councils, the Alberta Teachers Association, the Students Association of Mount Royal, and the Calgary Foundation. Thanks to all of them for contributing. And now, let's get to the rules and the format. This is a citizens forum. If you haven't been to one before, it's a little different than what you may be expecting. Uh, the questions for the first two-thirds of tonight's forum have been sourced from Calgarians at large. These are the people's questions for the candidates. Civic Camp asked Calgarians what questions they'd like to be asked at these forums. They then voted for which questions they thought were most important. And the top vote getting questions are what you will be hearing tonight. So here's how the format works. Each candidate will be uh, directly asked four questions and will be provided one minute and 30 seconds to respond. In the interest of time and to ask as many questions as possible, only two candidates will be asked to respond to each question. We won't hear from everyone on every question, but they can get in if they want to. Um, because we can't have every candidate answer every question, we want to provide the opportunity for each of them to answer four questions that aren't directly asked of them. Once the two candidates have answered the question, I'll ask if anyone else would like to respond. Here's the fun part. They've got poker chips in front of them. See? Each of them has four. So once the question is answered by the two candidates who are asked of the question, they can jump in. They can only do it four times through the night, and they do it by throwing one of those tokens into the cup. You get to do that four times. If you do that, you get 45 seconds on that question. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Anyway, I look forward to that. Along with two special question rounds in total, that means every candidate should have an answer, a chance to answer 10 questions. I told you that Civic Camp was band camp for poli sci majors, right? So they designed this whole thing, but it will all work. Now, here are the rules. Respect the clock. We do have a big clock here. You can keep an eye on it as well to help me out. The candidates can see it. Make it easy for the audience to listen. Please don't interrupt other candidates while they're speaking. I'll be quite strict on that. 
stay issues focused. This is a forum. That's the idea here. We don't want any personal attacks. Let the audience decide. We ask the supporters in the room, leave your signs outside. Everyone's done that. That's great. But you can cheer. You can make noises if you want to. Try not to interrupt the candidates while they're speaking. All right? Applause is okay. They like applause. They need encouragement. So let's get to it, shall we? Candidates now will all introduce themselves. They get two minutes each, and in interest of fairness, we're just going to start at the far end of the table and work our way across. We see the clock is ready at two minutes. First up, Larry Heather. Larry. I thank you, the assembled Calgarians in this room, for coming tonight, and those that are live streaming. Uh, I don't know if you want a drink of water out there. No. See my website at larryforcalgary.ca. I'm your option for a free enterprise with car mobility, social conservatism, and a Christian choice on the ballot. This coming weekend is Thanksgiving, and we can thank God for the blessings that he has given us as Calgarians. Our energy resources in Alberta are a divine gift that has brought prosperity and blessing to all of us. Unfortunately, the ungrateful, unthankful, have a way of twisting things out of perspective through phony environmentalism or misplaced maudlin sympathies like putting a dog's head on a turkey and saying, would you eat your dog? Happy Thanksgiving. Well, we have a broken covenant as a city with the God of the Bible that needs to be renewed if we are going to find our way back to where we once belonged. Get back, get back to avoiding things in the streets of Calgary that bring down the displeasure of Almighty God. Deuteronomy 6.15, The Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Isaiah 42.8, I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. Our race, no matter what color we have, is an unchangeable God-given gift to be celebrated. But our religion can be inadequate to the task at hand as we face the job of merit as candidates. Both Christianity and Islam are multiracial faiths. But I firmly believe it is a mistake for Calgarians to endorse a swearing-in to office on the Koran. The values from that book do not produce a basis for maintaining a Western democracy. Seated. Now with two minutes to introduce himself, Bruce Jackman. Bruce? Hello. Uh, that's pretty loud. I'm Bruce Jackman, and I'd like to thank you all for being here and being interested in what's happening in the election today. So I've lived here my whole life, 57 years in Calgary, and love all of it. It's a great place to live. I've also worked for you for 35 years already, mostly with the Water Services Department, providing water in your drinking tap. Early on, though, I worked in the Parks Department, developing uh, pathways and building parks in general, playgrounds. So I've been here for quite a while as a frontline worker, and I've observed middle management for many years and had a lot of questions as to their authority, which they know they have, but the integrity and also the responsibilities that they, they don't always come through with. Uh, we seem to waste a lot of money just figuring things out and letting it for the next engineer to look at, the new guy. I've seen so many projects get shuffled along and it just it's a multi-ring circus that costs us money. Then we also have things that uh, never get done, like the 37th Street connector out in southwest Calgary. It's not a ring road, it's a four-lane road, 60 kilometers an hour, probably a tunnel, a bridge, and a tunnel. And it would connect southwest Calgary right down to Spruce Meadows and bring all those people right back into Calgary. The ring road is a provincial responsibility. They've already taken care of 75% of it. Why don't we let them just take care of the rest of it? So as a citizen, I'd like to see more honesty and integrity of our councillors. I'd like to see more openness. Uh, straight up, you know, there is no such thing as surprise tax money. Everybody that's doing their job brings forth their budgets, their expenditures and their savings. Before the council sits down to look at big budget, there is no surprise money 
They're always aware of these revenues. Time's up. Thanks Thank very you, much. Thank you, sir. Next up, John Lord. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. And thank you to all my worthy opponents for standing up. Uh, and we're all committed to making this a better city. And we all want that. The question before you is a tough choice. Who is best able to deliver on what we all want? Who, who has the credentials? Who has the experience? And most importantly, who has the track record? Because past performance is really the only indicator of future performance that you can count on. You know, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a, a, a really interesting few days for me. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of people have get, been getting lots of exercise jumping to conclusions about how serious I am about this campaign and saying how serious can he be really when he chooses a barbecue competition in the middle of a mayoral election. Well, you know, they say the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. And obviously, to get to the World Championships, I had to be really serious about that. And I am very serious about this election campaign, and I am in it to win it. And we believe that that is possible. I mean, this is Calgary, after all. Anything is possible in such a great city. So I am very serious. But you know what? It was never about the barbecue at all anyway. If it was just me going, I would have canceled out. But other people were counting on me. I made a commitment to them and I keep my commitments. When we started this campaign, when I started this campaign and put my name forward, I had made this commitment a long time ago and it was the big fly in the ointment. I mean, really, you know, my, my opponent has, what, 600 grand in the bank and years to plan, so he comes out looking very professionally. I have zero in the bank uh, and a few days to plan. So far, pretty good odds there. Uh, but I did have this commitment right in the middle of the campaign and it was going to be really, really tough to keep that commitment. But I keep my commitments anyway. And I think Lord, that the people of up. Calgary will want a mayor who keeps his commitments. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next up, two minutes, Nahid Nenshi. Thank you very much, David. And uh, first of all, let me say thank you to Civic Camp and to the University of Calgary Students Union uh, for co-hosting this debate. I was reminded today, um, of course I have a background with both organizations, but I was reminded today by the president, the current president of the Students Union that I was president of the Students Union 20 years ago. That was not a very nice thing for him to say. <laughs> I was nine. But it's always wonderful uh, to come home. And I'm particularly happy to be here in this position to have a chance to talk to you about where we are as a community and where we've been and where we're going. I'm very proud of this city. I'm proud of the track record of this council. I encourage you to check out the report cards that I do every year. I just published one on how well the council is doing. And I'm pleased to say that your city council has accomplished a lot in the last three years. In fact, I stood in the room downstairs three years ago and presented 12 ideas, 10 of which we've accomplished or significantly gotten on the road to accomplishing. The remaining two, well, we still got some work to do, campaign finance reform and secondary suites. But I'm also proud of the place we live. The Economist magazine, yet again this year, ranked Calgary as one of the top five cities in the world in which to live. It's a pretty big accomplishment for a city of 1.2 million on the Canadian prairie. But you know what? We can do better. We can be better. We can be even better. And through even better transportation, even better community, even better government, and particularly even better growth, we can build this community to be something even greater than what we are now. 110 days ago, we faced an enormous test, the greatest natural crisis we'd ever seen in our city's history. And thanks to the incredibly hard work of public servants of every stripe, but mostly thanks to the incredible citizens whom we serve, willing to use their own two hands to help their neighbors out of pain, we passed that test. And that proved what a great place we are. And that's time. Our next candidate, Milan Pepez, two minutes. Thank you all for coming today. And uh, I have uh, noticed that in Alberta, we have to make a major change to our political arena. We witnessed what happened to our healthcare and now to the floods. Two and a half years ago, University of Saskatchewan 
issued a warning to government of Alberta that flood can happen any time, and Alberta government ignored this warning. City politicians, city council, wasted $300 million on a tunnel, which we don't need. We don't have a short-term strategy for sea train on 7th Avenue, which came to the dead end five years ago. We don't have short-term strategy for traffic jams on Deerfoot Trail, Crochard Trail, and everywhere in the city. City Council failed to the fact that Alberta emergency alarm came 12 hours late, while in fact in Kenmore came after homes and bridges were washed down and highways blocked by roads. Uh, until today, City Council did nothing to get province of Alberta to install system in mountains to predict floods, so flood can happen any time. And we must stop this ignorance of our politicians. On the campaign trail, I met many women who told me what they need. If elected, I will be looking forward to find financing to subsidize transit passes for single mothers, and I will lobby businesses for women to get equal pay for equal jobs. And uh, recently, I was attacked by Calgary Herald, and I'd like to use this opportunity to tell the Calgary Herald that I have survived Hitler's Nazis, Stalin communists, and I will survive these nasty attacks from Calgary Herald. And I make a plea to Calgary Herald, stop these attacks, because they hurting all four of my children. And I hope that Calgary Herald will get this message. Thank you, Thank Mr. Peppers. It's time. Our next candidate, Norm Perot. Thank you. I was raised on a ranch. I've had calluses on my hands for over 55 years. Single parent, raised three boys by myself. Concerning 52 million, give it back. Those who are not struggling financially, by all means, give it to flood relief or city managers, whatever. Calgary is becoming unaffordable to a lot of people, especially to seniors who built this city. It is if this financial disaster continues, we could become the next Detroit which is bankrupt because of their city council's greed. I drove, it drove the car manufacturing industry to Mexico. I've been a contractor for over 40 years and never exceeded my estimate or tender. If I can't estimate properly, I eat the difference or get out of business. Cost overrun, cost plus, cost whatever excuse is not acceptable to me. Stop the waste. Let's save hundreds of millions and lower the taxes by getting the right people for the job. Taxpayers are not a bottomless pit of money for the city's entitlement. Together we can bring Calgary back under control by using common sense and hard work to get better value for our dollar, more done sooner for less. The unnecessary flood, there are many witnesses to verify that I predicted the flood two weeks before it happened, why it would happen, how bad it would be, and how to mitigate it. Could have saved billions of dollars, personal misery, downtown, stampede ground, and most homes. Wouldn't it be better to predict a flood and mitigate it before it happens and get things done right instead of just tossing money around like it's endless? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pro. Next candidate, Jonathan Sundstrom. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me here, and I'd like to salute the rest of the candidates. I'd like to thank everyone, especially Civic Camp, because uh, I'm not running, quote unquote, to win. I'm running actually to provide a bit of a discourse and a dialogue, and I think it's really important. I do respect uh, Mr. Nentry's ability to converse with the public. Even though a person may or may not agree with his position, I have to respect somebody who doesn't run and hide, and I think it's really important. I really think that the transparency of the issues that address this city have to be front and center. Uh, I ran in 2007 against uh, a slate of candidates, including David Broncogne. It wasn't to win at that time, it was just to raise issues about how the city would, could, or should be better. Yet at that time, we see things like the Peace Bridge and the Louise Crossing fiasco, which I still maintain is a uh, criminal of some sort behavior there of assets of city-owned property being sold well below market value. <clears throat> Now we have a situation where if we're looking at the next four years, where it's going to take us to the year 2017. We've had issues with homeless for years and years and years. I think we need some really creative ways to resolve this issue once and for all. 
You also have some of the things on the radar screen that were not being discussed, and, and I respect the fact that Mr. Nechi is busy with this thing, and I do believe that the council and uh, the mayor's office has achieved many different things. But we also have a new hockey arena. I haven't heard any talk from the Flames organization as to any kind of tax subsidy that they might be looking for. That should be something that every councillor, uh, any candidate should be answering. Conversely so, perhaps one should uh, like, uh, take a look at selling NMAX. All these things should be on the table. And I'm not going to get uh, cut off by David Gray. I'm not going to run out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, our last candidate for the opening introductory se uh, session, Carter Thompson. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out and allowing me to address the concerns we have for our city. There are a few select issues I believe we need to tackle that will help resolve many other issues currently facing us. First, we have to support business. Business is the key to prosperity. It brings jobs, more people, more tax revenue without significantly increasing the existing rates. Current tax rates and development policies are stagnating business growth in the city, and it's got to change. Our current mayor aligns himself with the Pembina Institute, an organization dedicated to shutting down our oil sands projects. On the other hand, he's critical of the Manning Institute that supports business and leadership training for our citizens. Development within our city needs to be addressed, and I will. Current rules and processes for submitting development permits is time consuming and expensive. In order to get development moving in Calgary, we got to simplify it. By simplifying it, we'll allow people to get on with construction at lower administrative cost to the city. There are areas for new development but stagnated due to old infrastructure that cannot handle increased population in the area. Issues such as what, who should pay for the upgrade have to be resolved. I will undertake to find a fair and equitable solution for all parties in this. Transportation is brutal in our town. Whether you're taking a taxi, driving around, trying to take transit, the current city council endorses traffic congestion, saying it's good for the city. I say we got to fix it. We got to review the transit routes. Is there a way to adjust transit routes throughout the city and throughout the day so that we can get across town without everybody having to go downtown? Taxi service is another example. Our taxi service is broken. We have a taxi rules going up 100 years in the past. We need to get out of the business, let business decide who takes care of commercial transport. Recreation facilities, serious lack. Uh, there's been a deficit. We haven't been addressing our recreation issues at all. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to your questions. And if any of you are playing the YYC bingo, it's a full blackout, not just one line. Thank you. All right. Thanks to all of our candidates for your opening remarks. It's time now for the crowdsource questions. Each question will be asked of two candidates. Uh, the people who answered the questions that was chosen earlier completely at random. So here's question one. Each of the two candidates uh, chosen, and then this round it would be Milan Papez, candidate one, and Larry Heather, candidate two. So this question is for the two of you. Mr. Papez, you'll be going first. You'll have one minute and 45 seconds to answer, okay? Is that clear? Anybody who wants to jump in, that's why you have the poker chips in front of you. One minute, 30 seconds. Ooh, we're tightening. I like it. Okay, here we go. One minute, 30 seconds. Thank you. Here's the first question. Mr. Pepez, this goes to you. How will you ensure that all Calgarians have access to the recreational and sports facilities they need for their ongoing health and well-being? The clock in a, starts now. In the present situation of the floods and... Uh, our budget of the city, uh, we definitely cannot really expand our sports facilities as we wish, but we should uh, explore how uh, they do doing it in other countries like Germany, Sweden, or Finland, and they may have uh, better ideas how to establish the facilities for sport uh, at lower cost. And this way, we should uh, explore every possibility to implement it here in Calgary. And uh, I think that we have uh, right now uh, an issue the may call uh, golf cars, which we should uh, convert into the park and sports facilities. And uh, we can build uh, soccer fields, we can build uh, 
uh, even swimming pools and all other facilities which are required by the city and uh, not to convert it into the industrial area, keep it as a green space and uh, that would be like a major step uh, to improve the position of the sports facilities in the city. Thank you, Mr. Um, thank you. Larry Heather, same question. Would you like me to repeat it? No, that's fine. I was asked the same question by Sports Calgary Council, and I was provoked to uh, investigate the original document for Sports Calgary, which was 2005, the Civic Sports Policy, and I found the language overreaching, too expansive, too many areas covered that take away from community organically connected sports in the community. And I, one of the evidences of an overly expansive document is that so many balls are being juggled in the air at once that things begin to suffer. So it's been eight years since that was enacted as policy for the city. And I've gotten reports of facilities that are being neglected, even ice rinks, uh, that are on the point of, of getting very neglected because I feel there's too many other priorities that are stealing uh, time and resources away from this area. So I, I've even heard of reports of unqualified people operating facilities because of outside political interference in the employment. So I think there's a problem there. I'm not for all year round sports that professionalize children's sports and take away every other interest that they could possibly develop. I don't believe that they should be shut off from seasonal enjoyment of other developments. Thank you very much. Those were the, uh, that was the first of the crowdsource questions. Now to the second. The second question goes to Norm Perot. Oh, I didn't even hear a clink. Nessie, now. Now you're in. Okay, that's different. John Lord, you have 45 seconds. Thank you. I think building more sports facilities in our city is an absolutely critical need for our young people. In the last election, I put forward a number of good ideas of how we could actually do that and finance it. And I do have a financial background. Uh, because we're operating with not much money, we have to recycle. It's on my blog. You can read all about it from the last time. It was a good idea, idea then. It's a good idea now. And how we can do it is saving money by doing more with less. A bunch of the money could have been saved on the tunnel that could have been used to build soccer facilities. Regardless, there's rink in a box, there's arena in a box. There are some low-cost ways to do this, and we should be on it right away. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. High rollers, we have a second chip, Mr. Nenshi. Thanks, David. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about what your city council has done in this area. Uh, despite having the federal government at the very last moment pull back on promised funding for the rec centres, we were able to fund four new recreation centres, one in northwest Calgary, three in southeast Calgary. We'll break ground on the first one, I hope, before the, before the ground freezes, which I'm very excited about, as well as three new libraries. In addition, we were able to set aside a bunch of money for rehabilitation of existing arenas and community centres in community. And we did that, by the way, because the provincial government wouldn't fund it, by using that tax room that people are criticizing so much to create the community investment fund precisely to build these kind of facilities while keeping your taxes the lowest of any major city in Canada. No other poker players? All right, let's move to the next question. Candidate one is Norm Perot for this question. Candidate two, Nahid Nenshi. Here's the question. Norm, are you ready? Here's the question. With a vacancy rate approaching 0%, what long-term action will you take to ensure young professionals and students have a place to live in Calgary? You have a minute and a half. Well, to start out with, it, um, most of them don't understand how taxation is affecting their income. They're getting bombarded from all angles. So being, afford, being able to afford is only part of it. As far as the... Um, affordable, 
secondary suites, if they are done properly, safety in mind, so that they're not death traps, I think, and also taking into consideration parking issues, it's, a, it's very feasible to actually come up with a lot of uh, rental properties, basement suites, whatever. There's actually uh, a lot of people that are transients that come and go through the city, which, again, they'd be able to come and go a lot freer, almost like bread and, bed and breakfast. But uh, keep it affordable is the big thing. And uh, I think that there's some areas that could be developed. Like there's a school where I, where I live, the R.B. Bennett School, and there's a great big park area there. Um, it just sits. So I think there could be something done there with possibly parking or overflow parking for secondary suites. There are areas that can be designated for that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Perot. Would you like me to repeat the question? No, I think I'm okay. Okay. There's no question in my mind that we are facing a severe housing crisis in this city. Prior to the floods, we were sitting at a vacancy rate, depending on how you count, between 1.7 and 2.5%. No one's really tried to calculate it during or since the floods. I can tell you it's close to zero. And we need a multifaceted approach to do this. And if I am reelected, this will be a major priority of my first month in office to figure out how we get the best minds together to talk about housing, to create more housing choices in more neighborhoods throughout the city. Very briefly, we need more affordable housing. That's subsidized housing for people for very low income. We're probably short about 5,000 units in the city, and we celebrate when we manage to build a building with 150 units. Clearly, we need to do something differently. The Calgary Poverty Reduction Strategy has some ideas on that. In terms of affordable market rental, we need to work with provincial and federal governments to provide financial incentives for the construction of new rental housing. It's starting to happen in Calgary. I've heard talk of eight new rental towers being built in Calgary, the first in 20 years. Of course, we need to legalize secondary suites citywide. It's a right thing to do morally and legally and ethically to ensure that people can have access to safe, decent housing uh, in these secondary suites. And we need to encourage first-time home ownership. I'm very proud of the work that Attainable Homes Calgary has done, getting 250 people into home ownership who thought they'd never get there and saving up or freeing up 250 rental units. These are all small things. We need to work hard on an overarching issue to solve the housing crisis in the city. Thank you very much. John Lord was the first to drop a chip, so John Lord goes first, out of 45 seconds. When I was first elected to council in 1995, one of the first things I saw was a whole bunch of echo baby boomers who were teenagers then. They were going to get hammered when they started moving out of the house and there was no vacancy rates. And so I started then on a crusade for the only solution that I saw available at, at virtually no cost with a stroke of a pen, which was to legalize basement suites. It was really uphill, and it was painful, but I stuck with it. The problem is that city council only gets to say where they get zoned. The province gets to say how they get built under Alberta building codes. It was a major reason I left council to go provincial, to see if I could get that issue resolved, because there were no codes in the Alberta building codes, and thus you could never legalize them, even if the city zoned them. Well, I cheered up and got that meeting done. And they're now legal across the province, and I'm still working on it. All right. Thank you very much. (laughs) Next up, Larry Heather, 45 seconds. I do not support the elimination of R1 zoning in favor of citywide secondary suites. Like inclusionary zoning in new apartments, this is a type of economic desegregation that denies consumer a choice to locate in areas which have the district advantages of residential one zones. Lacking this in Calgary, they will flee to the bedroom communities that still provide such a choice with the resultant loss of the property tax base. Families naturally resist this sort of backdoor social engineering because of the following. The original promise of existing owners who bought intentionally into R1 is violated and this broken covenant becomes a cycle of distrust and <clears throat> activates a flight response. Thank you, Mr. Heather. We have another chip, Carter Thompson. 
Well, in areas where the zoning allows for secondary suites, absolutely. By improving the permit approval process, we can entice more people to complete these suites safely. One thing people need to realize is that adding a relatively small number of secondary suites will not do much to alleviate the current housing crisis. Not all houses are constructed in a way to allow secondary suites. Calgary needs to allow lower cost housing to be developed in areas that make sense. To address this requirement, we need to work with developers to construct lower cost housings in areas that would most benefit the people using this type of housing. Areas around our post-secondary institutions come to mind, transit hubs, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. No more chips. We'll move to the third question. This goes to Carter Thompson, who will kick us off, and then Bruce Jackman. Are you ready for the question? Simply, do you believe that urban sprawl is a problem for the city? If you believe it is a problem, what will you do to address it? Mr. Thompson, you have one minute and 30 seconds. No, I don't think urban sprawl is a problem. I think an issue is lacking development in areas where there could be development. Another issue is more balanced communities that have a variety of services, jobs, and recreation. We currently have no means of determining who should be paying for upgrades to inadequate facilities in established areas. The current council has not addressed this issue, but I fully intend to implement policy related to this issue. Once resolved, we can work with current homeowners and developers to start designing and building appropriate higher density housing in these neighborhoods. Most Calgarians want to raise their families in a house with a yard, and we shouldn't be telling people how to live. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, Bruce Jackman, same question. Well, I've lived here a long time. Uh, Calgary is growing tenfold. Uh, we have an urban sprawl problem, but we're a very popular community, obviously. As far as affordable housing, uh, I remember the house I live in, when I first bought it, was 12% interest. And that expired in a year, and I had an opportunity to renew it 16% for five years. That was my only option. No, it wasn't. I got two roommates. I did not create a secondary suite. I got two roommates that I could trust to pay me the cash. I've heard a lot of heartache about renting properties. Um, urban sprawl is something that's happening here. I'd like to see more high density. We have a lot of inner city land for sale, and it's not the East Village. I feel sorry for the people that have invested down there in the floodplain. We have better places to build high rises. There's been projects at uh, the mall out on, um, oh boy, Bow Trail there. Uh, there's been projects at the North Hill Mall. There's been projects at the Brentwood Mall. Lots of acreage with place to put high density. Not everybody wants a yard. I have a yard, I love my yard. That's me. Uh, some people desire the low maintenance. It should all be available. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jackman. We have a poker chip. Mr. Ninch. I'm halfway done. <laughs> Won't have to hear much from you later. Um, yes, urban sprawl is a problem. Calgary's footprint is the same as the 10 boroughs of New York with one-tenth of the population. And of course, people need more choices. The problem is that we haven't been giving them choices. Councils in the past have put their thumb on the scale in, or in favor of one form of housing, which is single-family housing on the low-density single-family housing on the edges of the city. We need it. There will always be place for it. But for too long, more than 100% of our growth was happening on the fringes. We were emptying our city out from the, from the center. We need a much more balanced approach, and that starts by ending the financial subsidy that we pay the sprawl subsidy to urban sprawl. And I encourage people to visit endthesubsidy.ca to understand a lot more on the balanced approach we need on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Nenshi. Now, we have two chips that have been laid. Make that three. Uh, we'll do them in order. Uh, Jonathan Sundstrom. As far as I'm concerned, yes, we do have a serious urban sprawl issue. I lived in Bright Creek from 1985 onwards, so you start to see the creeping. What happens is it takes away what makes a place and a space desirable. My sentiment is I understand that the developers have different motives, 
And that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. However, what happens is, as we talk about the downtown core, and I live the downtown core, you do get a hollow in out effect. If I want to come and visit somebody here, there, or everywhere, you have to drive miles and miles and miles. And anyone who doesn't have a vehicle is in a real difficult situation. Um, I just think it really affects the quality of life having to run that far off to go see people. And I do not support the developer subsidies unless they were allocated perhaps to affordable housing. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Sundstrom. Also laying a chip, Mr. Heather, were you next? Yeah, I thought so too. Oh, uh, Mr. Jackman, it's, it's your poker game. I feel free. Uh, on the urban end. Come on, let's think about the East Village. I, I've heard of over $400 million of city assets go down there in a flood zone. That is a subsidy. We are saying, oh, we'll pay these people and build them a neighborhood and they can pay us back. That is the worst subsidy we've been involved in for a long time. That's, that's a nowhere place. It should have been a park. Thanks, Mr. Jackman. I guess there was another chip down there, to be clear. Mr. Heather, are you next? Okay, I think go ahead. So. You have 45 seconds. Well, I think it's important that we not demonize the developing and house building community of Calgary. These, these new areas are fully paid for except the water and the sewer lines, and that's recovered when the tax base comes in and populates that area. So this is really a uh, slap. We live in the second largest landmass country in the world. We are not Holland, blocked in by the sea. We have room to expand and Proper family desires demand that space, not stacked up layer after layer, not knowing who your kids are crossing when they're coming through the elevator. We want security mm -hmm. for our children. Thank you, Mr. Head. Was there another chip? Did I miss one? All right. Let's move to the next question. This is our fourth crowdsource question and the last before the lightning round. The question goes this time to Jonathan Sundstrom and to John Lord. The question is, how do you think we can create greater mobility choices, biking, walking, and transit, in addition to cars, in the city? Jonathan Sundstrom, you start. You have one minute and 30 seconds. The last part was it? Uh, I'll, re I'll repeat the question. Let's not start the clock till we're done. How do you think we can create greater mobility choices? biking, walking, and transit in addition to cars in the city? Ooh, well, as far as I'm concerned, I think Calgary Transit's a real key to that. I mean, we could talk about synchronization of street lights. Obviously, some of the bike lanes, I think, are, are beneficial. Some are a little bit questionable in terms of just safety or otherwise. I mean, the, I guess the question here a person would have to ask himself is, would you like your son or daughter riding on a certain bike lane at nighttime where you feel comfortable or safe? I still believe that Calgary Transit requires some fundamental changes to it to make it much more responsive to the customer needs. I'm not just... Case in point, uh, downtown. Uh, you go downtown to visit somebody and your friends are leaving. Uh, I can maybe catch a ride with a, a friend or take a taxi. No, I'll go take a train. You can stand at the First Street LRT station and here it is eight, nine months after the whole West LRT has been expanded. It's indicating and announcing that their trains come and pick you up and there's no trains coming. So the communication of the system is poor for even just a, an ordinary citizen. I do believe that the LRT train system should be going 24 hours. I do believe that we should be using shuttle buses 24 hours to give that option. Case in point, when the West LRT was announced by David Bronconi in 2007, at that time it's $700 million. For one half of that, $350 million, we could have quadrupled our buses in the city. So now if the West LRT went a billion dollars over budget, do the math. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sundstrom. John Lord, one minute, 30 seconds. Well, thank you, and obviously this was a, a, a key issue. When I was on council, I started studying all kinds of solutions to how we can get greater mobility and get rid of traffic congestion and move people faster. Uh, one of the things that uh, was obvious to me was roundabouts, for starters that uh, instead of traffic lights, they've, they've transformed cities all across uh, Europe now and uh, particularly Britain where you have large cities with only a few traffic lights. Really speeds up the traffic, gets rid of the congestion. 
I studied Curitiba, Brazil, where Mayor Lerner down there was transforming his city by saying, you know what, LRT is too expensive. Buses are the way to go. And he redesigned the bus routes in concentric circles and not just spokes, and has transformed that city, doing more with less, better transportation with a lot less. We spend our money on LRT. What could we have done with buses on that one? And then I also looked at why don't we get the cars off the road in the first place? How about telework? In the 90s, I introduced the notion of telework to the city. I said it's a solution on so many fronts that we really ought to jump on this. That was 1998, way ahead of the curve. Calgary won awards for our program a few years later doing telework, but we haven't even touched what we could really be doing there to get vehicles off the road in the first place and make everything easier for bicycles and walking. And why not bring businesses, small businesses, back to neighborhoods so you don't have to be driving across town to go to the Walmarts anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lord. All right, I heard two chips. Norm, yours was the second one. Who was the first down here? Larry Heather, go ahead. The mayor of Calgary should diligently seek to work with Calgary Council to serve the actual mobility needs of Calgarians. The fact is the lives of Calgarians are far more complex than any city social engineering planner could imagine or be capable of appreciating. Whether it is picking up the school kids, getting them to soccer, volunteering after work, or getting to vital business contacts outside the core, Calgarians' complex needs for quick, out of LRT range destinations must be honored in a humble servant attitude. I would seek to prioritize the decreasing of time and money costs of traveling in this great city of Western freedom. Thank you, Mr. Ed. Norm Perot, 45 seconds. Synchronizing lights is really interesting. They syn synchronize them to frustrate drivers and create road rage. <laughs> Apart from that, um, cyclists, I know a lot of cyclists, I ride a bike, and the problem is, during rush hour, taking right in the middle of the lane, you get a cyclist that's uninsured, unregistered, and just screwing up the traffic. Now that needs to change. They also go through red lights, stop signs, just carry on like it's insane. Some of the bike lanes are too wide and you never see any bikes on them, or hardly ever, such as the one beside Home Road. Let's change something here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pro. Did I hear another chip? Yes. We actually, if we look at ourselves in the city, we have too many cars on our roads. We, we cannot move anymore. We come on a deer foot, we come on a crop chart, and they converting into the parking lots. And answer to this issue is definitively the transit. We have failed to build the transit to the amount of the population which was growing, and we neglected that issue that we're getting too many cars. And the only answer to the, this situation is to limit the amount of the cars on our roads and improve our transit situation. Especially, I, mm -hmm. I see the world Thank you, that, Mr. Uh, uh, a C train or LRT is not the answer. But if we look at any city Time's up, in sir. North America, then everybody is using a train from the small towns and around the city. We're done. We don't. Thank you very much. If there are no other chips, it's time for the lightning round. Um, you may forget what the lightning round is all about. We'll tell you. Uh, there are going to be four questions in the lightning round. The idea here, and you can keep your chips down for this, chips do not apply during the lightning round. Um, the idea here is you get... Start out with a yes or a no in response to the question. That will really help clarify the issues, okay? So, four candidates for each question. The four candidates for the first question are Milan Papez, Larry Heather, Norm Perot, and Nahed Nenshi. Mr. Papez, you'll be going first. You'll have 30 seconds to answer. And you begin with a yes or a no. Here's the question. Will you commit to release, releasing a list of your campaign donors before election day? 
Why or why not, Mr. Pepes? I definitely will, because I have made a decision before the election that I will donate all my donations to the flood victims. All right. Thank you very much. Short and to the point. Larry Heather, 30 seconds. Absolutely not. Uh, there's pressures brought to bear on donors during elections, and I don't want to see, I'm not getting any big donations from uh, unions or professional associations, but I think it's wrong to put that kind of pressure on. They are required to be released at the end of the year, and that'll be reported on in March of 2014. I feel that's sufficient because we don't want to get into this bullying tactic that can take place when the donors are made known mm -hmm. and they're visited at their businesses or whatever. I think that's wrong. Thank you, sir. Norm Pro, do you want me to repeat the question? Yes, please. All right. The question is, will you commit to releasing a list of your campaign donors before Election Day? Why or why not? I can do it right now. I have no donors. Nobody's given me a cent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Perot. Finally, uh, Mr. Nenshi. Yes. I've been fighting hard for campaign finance reform since long before I was elected. I think, unlike uh, Mr. Heather, that transparency is the absolute cornerstone of democracy. Um, it's crazy to suggest otherwise. I have released my donors. I will update that list. I am thrilled that all but six or seven candidates across the city are doing the same, and I would encourage everyone to not vote for anyone who refuses to release their donors before the election. That was one of, the two, one of the two I didn't get out of the 12. I'll continue time, to fight for it. Time. Yeah. Time. Next question. The four candidates to answer this question are Carter Thompson, Bruce Jackman, Jonathan Sundstrom, and John Lord. The question is, starting with you, Carter Thompson, do you support a City of Calgary living wage policy? Mr. Thompson. Yes, in the short term, I will encourage Calgary business owners to support this increase by ensuring that full-time adult employees at my place of employment are all earning this minimum salary. This is going to be news to them. For the long term, Calgary needs to establish an environment that supports business growth and development. This growth will bring with it more higher-paying jobs, which will reduce the number of people earning below poverty wages. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Bruce Jackman. Uh, yes, I support this living wage policy. I believe it's been a policy with the City of Calgary for quite a few years. Any outsourced services or purchases must provide living wages to their employees already. So I hope the City has maintained this policy. Thank you, sir. Jonathan Sunster. Yes, I do. I believe Switzerland or, uh, has just actually started to implement a program of that nature. Something like that's going to be a little bit tricky because we do have a federal government, a provincial government, and whatever else. We have a lot of different foreign workers and things that could almost be considered to be a race to the bottom of the wages uh, and make it much more competitive and difficult. But this is an expensive city to live in, and it's affecting the quality of life in many facets. So, yes, I do support it. Thank you. Thank you. John Lord. I studied this issue extensively, and boy, would I love to support this if I actually thought it worked to reduce poverty. But it doesn't. It's a myth. Many small business owners are not earning minimum wage themselves. How are they going to pay that to their employees? They have to lay someone off to pay the rest of them. So I came up with the earned income tax credit, which the United States uses, which has lifted millions out of poverty, and which we do not have in Canada. And that's what I'd like to see promoted instead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lord. Time for the third question of the lightning round. The four candidates to answer this are Jonathan Sundstrom, Norm Perot, John Lord, and Larry Heather. Here's the question, starting with you, Mr. Sundstrom. Do you support legalization of secondary suites in all existing neighborhoods, subject only to reasonable safety concerns? Why 
or why not? Yes, um, why, why not? Hmm. Uh, yes, I do. I, I think that it really comes down to a matter of management when you do something like that. And unlike Mr. Heather, I actually feel that in terms of spirit of community, these things can actually all be worked out. Uh, it, it actually can provide a better diversity for the community. I can understand certain people not wanting it in the area, but once you try it, I think they'll find it works out well. Mr. Perot. Yeah, as long as there's a safety first, parking secondary, and it should be fair throughout the city, not some areas that think they're better than others and they expect different rules or whatever. So we need to pull together, use common sense. You know, why can't we get along? That's really a bottom line, instead of pulling in different directions all the time. Thank you. Solving half of the problem by taking away the excuse that they're not legal under the building codes, I went back to getting into the zoning and how we're going to do this under the zoning. And having spent 15 years on it, I have great strategies of how we're going to do that. But I didn't get elected mayor in order to do that. So I humbled myself and went and worked at City Hall in the automatic offices, and Peter DeMong brought the motion to legalize them in all new subdivisions. So we can create tens of thousands of them now, legal, Time. safe, in new subdivisions, except he's shutting down new subdivisions. Time again. Thank you. Larry Secondary. Heather, 30 seconds. Secondary suite zones have a high transient renter, renter population that who are not normally invested in the long-term future of the community. This decreases property values and lessens security, especially for seniors and families with children. These are issues that do not impact students, but the loss of any available R1 zones in Calgary due to their house buying years in the will be a driving motivation in the future. Thousands of illegal suites and of uneven time. quality exist now. Thank you, Mr. Heather. Question four, reminder, these are all crowdsource questions. Question four of the lightning round. Four candidates, starting with Nahed Nenshi, then Carter Thompson, then Milan Papez, and then Bruce Jackman. The question beginning with Mr. Nenshi is, with the government initiating a plan to support local sustainability in the food system, can we expect a positive move towards urban agriculture? I wanted the secondary suite question, but I'm happy to answer this one. Um, there is, in fact, a new plan uh, in place uh, for sustainable food in Calgary uh, overall and looking at our food production and distribution systems. To be honest with you, I find the plan very heavy on platitudes and light on specifics, uh, and I've been pushing back on developing that. Uh, I stood here three years ago and said that if there was a huge move uh, to things like urban chickens in the city and trying that as a pilot project. I love pilot projects, love to try Time. it out. <clears throat> there has not been support on council for that yet. Time. I'd be interested to see if there is uh, going forward. Carter Thompson, would you like me to repeat the question? Sure, far away. Yeah. With the government initiating a plan to support local sustainability in the food system, can we expect a positive move towards urban agriculture? I do support the establishment of community gardens in already established communities and to ensure that green spaces within new communities include space for community gardens. I will have our parks department dedicate areas within existing parks as community gardens. This way we don't have potato farms popping up all over the place and poor old bylaw has to come and shut them down. I also promise to help our urban forestry and we'll plant 500 trees every year after I'm elected mayor. Thank you. Milan Papas. Yes, I, I would support uh, this program in uh, full length because in uh, tradition of the city of Calgary, we could have seen that uh, every house and every one has been involved in producing vegetables and even chickens in, in Anzers property. And it would help to majority of the people to sustainability of the food. End time. Thank you, sir. 
Bruce Jackman, would you like me to repeat the question? Uh, no, thank you. But uh, yeah, sustainable food is important. I eat daily. I've always, uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I've been interested in high-rise greenhouses, uh, backyard greenhouses, aquaculture. There's all sorts of industry that, that can be developed inside the city to create some sort of food source. It's true. And yes, I, I would be in favor of research and development. Thank you very much. That ends the lightning round. Time to return now to crowdsource questions. And yes, your poker chips can be used again. Here we go. This question goes to Larry Heather and to Norm Perot. Mr. Heather, you will reply first. Here's the question. What would you do to support the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative, and how would your efforts improve that initiative? You have one minute and 30 seconds. I think any such plan that has the title End Poverty is unrealistic. We can work on it, but we can solve the poverty problems by subsidy for a thousand Calgarians and a thousand more move. So the moment you have a title that says plan to end poverty in Calgary, you're way off base and it's, the program is open for abuse. I've heard reports of the local shelters where a lot of the goods donated are in fact going to employees and they're loading their cars up at different hours of the day and taking off and selling the stuff. Now, this is, this is very serious. You, the poverty industry, Jesus said the poor you will always have with you. That's because of human nature as well. What others do to others and what people do to themselves when they choose a poverty lifestyle that perpetuates problems both for themselves and their others. One of the greatest poverty creators is single motherhood. Men running off from their responsibilities and leaving women single to fight alone. This is a great poverty generator and we need to make these men live up to their responsibilities and act like men. Thank you, Mr. Heather. Norm Pro, would you like me to repeat the question? The question again, what would you do to support the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative and how would your efforts improve that initiative? There's probably millions of square feet of flat rooftops on all these high rises downtown and schools and government buildings all over. Why not use hydroponics and grow gardens and flowers, whatever, to uh, herbs? That could go to the food bank, the poor people. You know, it's just sitting there being wasted. Why not do something with it? I've invented a wind generation system, if you will, and it's quite a bit more efficient than those ones they use on these wind farms. Each roof could have one of those. That would save cost of electricity for the poor people. And if they can't use all that is grown, and it could be allotted a certain square footage, they could uh, pass it on to somebody else that doesn't need it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perot. Carter Thompson threw a chip in. 45 seconds. While still reviewing the details of this initiative, I think there's a great things that we could do with community-based cooperation. My platform right now supports implementation of community gardens in both established and new communities and opening up to development to include low-cost housing. Not all low-cost housing needs to be downtown where the highest cost of development is. We can develop around existing transit hubs and future transit hubs, and part of the development can be low-cost housing. The current buildings downtown are aging and the land is too valuable. Let's move these buildings and their assets to other areas of the city where we'll be able to get way more bang for our buck and help out our, our poorer people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. We can actually limit the uh, population of homeless by 60%, as has been done uh, across the United States, by providing a treatment 
for mentally ill people, especially with schizophrenia, because 60% of people in homeless shelter are seriously mentally ill people. If they get a treatment, 90% of these people can live normal lives, so they can make and produce money, pay for medication and everything else. And we can save billions of dollars and 60% of the seats in our homeless shelters. And we can allocate more money for uh, reminding people who are homeless and living in the poverty at the same time. Thank you, sir. If there are no other chips, I'll move to the next question. We have a chip down. So, you have hi. 45 seconds, sir. Yeah, I used to be poor, and then I got a job. It's kind of weird. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, this is how it happened. Like, well, my dad left, too, and Larry's got a point. I had four brothers, and I didn't get allowance when I was a kid. I cut uh, Ed Whalen's grass. You know, I uh, shoveled the neighbor's walk. I dug gardens for cash, and cash is tax-free, and, yeah, I was still poor, but I had money to spend. But no, no, I saw later on that you need a real job, you need structure, and uh, I don't know, training can help structure. Uh, I didn't have to get up today, I didn't have to come here. You know that, it's a choice. Uh, it's not always a mental illness, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jack. Any other chips? Let's go to the next question. It'll be answered first by Nahid Nenshi, second by Carter Thompson. Here's the question. What would you do to get the McLeod Trail Sun Valley Boulevard interchange built to reduce shortcutting traffic on Sun Valley Boulevard? Mr. Nenshi. So this is an interesting question um, because, in fact, we tried hard to convince the province to build that as part of the Southeast Ring Road. It's a bit ridiculous that the Southeast Ring Road, which hopefully will open in a week, um, ends just short of the McLeod Trail 22X interchange. And in fact, just before the provincial election, I had great conversations with the then Ministry of Transportation and they were going to build it. Uh, and it just didn't come out into the, uh, into the budget discussions. Now the suggestion is that they will build it as part of an eventual Southwest Ring Road. And as you know, for 60 years, mayors have been saying, we're optimistic that the Southwest Ring Road will come soon. So we're optimistic that the Southwest Ring Road will come soon. <laughs> um, and in fact, I am very optimistic. I know the broad strokes of the Sutina agreement. Um, I think it's a win-win-win, a win for the city, a win for the Sutina, a win for the province. Their referendum is shortly after our election. Uh, and if that referendum passes, then that interchange will become part of that project. If the referendum fails, um, we do have to think hard about how to keep Southwest Calgary moving, as I've said before. That includes better transit, it includes the changes we're making at the moment to 14th Street Southwest, and all of these things help to shut down shortcutting. But I have suggested to the province that even if the Southwest Ring Road northern part is never built, we should extend the Ring Road through 22X to the western city limit, which would include the interchange at McLeod Trail uh, and 22X. Thank you. Mr. Thompson, you have a minute and a half. Traffic congestion throughout the city is a key priority for all of us. We're frustrated sitting in traffic. This isn't the only neighborhood. We've got fixes that we have to do all over the city. So with any luck, like his worship says, the ring road happens. I'm optimistic too. It's looking good. Um, but uh, I think one of the best things we could do is really try to get some better transit in through that area, in that area in particular. That's, that's just one area, but there's so many areas. So many areas that we sit in traffic. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. I heard a chip. Mr. Lord. Well, thank you. Yes, the real problem, of course, is money. And, you know, the province uh, has always been asked to put up all this money. They're not always sure it was well spent. I have really good relations with the provincial government, having been uh, an MLA there. Most of the people up there are former colleagues that I worked with side by side. I have an excellent ability to read what they need, what they will want in order to get the money to do this. The Southwest Ring Road is a really, really uh, serious problem and needs to be worked on right away. My plan for it was good three years ago. It's even better today and we would be able to build those things if we weren't wasting so much money and we were doing more with less, 
and our plan could be done now. Thank you, Mr. Lord. We heard a chip from Norm Perot. You have 45 seconds. If you want to know how to build a house, you don't ask a realtor. You ask a contractor that builds houses. As far as the roads, don't ask a politician. Ask a trucker. I mean, common sense, people. Thank you, Mr. Perot. No other chips? Next question. How's everybody holding up, by the way? Doing all right? We have two more questions before an intermission, so let's go to the next question. And this will be uh, candidate one will be Bruce Jackman, the second, Jonathan Sundstrom. Here's the question. Calgary is the only Canadian city of its size with no municipal grants for artists. What role should the city play in investing in its artists? Bruce Jackman, you have a minute and a half. Wow, boy, and I like art too. I'm a practicing artist. We already spend 1% of all our capital projects onto art. I think that's excessive. <laughs> uh, we can always incorporate art and design. It doesn't have to be a specific, uh, whatever they call that, candy cane peace bridge. No, that is not a piece of art. No, and he has not signed it either. It does not have a marble deck, and it does not have the specific special lighting that the artistic um, vision would have had. We don't know how much that would have cost either. But, you know, if we're going to buy a piece of art, it should be complete, and it should be functional. The bridge is functional, but it is not complete. It's not a piece of art. It's a cheap knockoff. So we also have... No... <laughs> Thank you. We also have uh, some sort of guy that creates poetry and stuff. Uh, people do that for free. Uh, you know, I don't know how much we pay him. He's probably a very nice fellow, but I, I love art, really. And there's, there's a lot of art in this town. There's musicians, there's, there's, there's uh, visual art, there's uh, Cantos is setting up in the East Village. Here's another major asset going on a flood zone. Even the Stampede, Stampede Ground is art, and, and the culture is art. I like art. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jackman. Jonathan Sundstrom, a minute and a half. I'm a big fan of art. Uh, that's a great question that you asked me this, just for the mere fact that uh, I'm actually in the midst of opening an art gallery right now in the downtown of Calgary, which is uh, between the Hyatt Hotel and the Bay on 7th Avenue. Historically considered to be the worst street in Calgary, which I looked at it and I thought, this is a fabulous opportunity to do something more positive. And not only this forum here, when I walk out the front door, you have this many people staring at you because they're looking at a sad, not uh, a sad street that really didn't have any kind of life or vitality to it. It has to be a combination of business and or artists working together if the city's going to put together a program. And I say that with some trepidation because I know that Calgary Arts Development does wonderful things. I just see an underutilization of places and spaces and that could be anything from a blank wall that we see all over here. Graffiti is something that is not a billboard because I certainly see a lot of advertising in the city and it really makes me wonder, is that what it has to be all about? You can't ride the train without being bombarded with advertising. Why cannot it be philosophical quotes on there or in public places and spaces? I'm really passionate about that and I think it could be much better executed if you have a mixture of business and artists together. Thank you, Mr. Sunster. No chips. We'll move to our final question before intermission. This question goes to John Lord and then to Milan Pepez. Here's the question. Do you believe that Calgary requires a city charter? What powers does the city need that it does not currently have? Beginning with John Lord, one minute and 30 seconds. Well, funding is a really key issue, obviously. And uh, we all know that something like 90% uh, of the taxes uh, go to the provincial and federal governments, and it creates issues for cities. All of the taxes cities used to have went away during the 30s and the 40s, during the Depression. 
the, the uh, higher levels of government took them all away. They only left the property tax, and that's probably the worst form of taxation, the most regressive form of taxation, the property tax, and it's very problematic. And so we do need to get different taxes uh, that the provincial and federal government are currently collecting and start talking about you know, sharing more of the gasoline tax and all these other things. Frankly, if we didn't have to tax so much because we got our costs down, that would help solve a lot of the problems that the city has. And I believe that there's a, a lot that can be done there. But yes, we do need to revisit the MGA. We do need to get in discussions, not just how much we are taxed, but how we are taxed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lord. So we have facing actually the issues of uh, our political situation, and especially in Canada, we can say, so we don't have a fair distribution of tax revenue. And we have to establish not only for the city, but we have to establish it within the province as well to get a fair share of the tax dollars, which goes to the federal government. And the federal government should be more generous to allocating the money for cities like Calgary, which actually started uh, historically way behind all the cities. And we, let's say in the 70s and 80s, we were just in the diapers with the transit system and everything. The federal government promised better share of the tax dollar for our sea train, for our project of highways, roads, ring road, and everything else, and they never deliver. Province never deliver. They make a tax cut, federal government made tax cuts, and we were never ever accomplished what we needed. That's why we today have a traffic jams. We don't have a sea train web developed for the transportation in the city and we have uh, no control over when we're gonna get money. We, right now, we can do nothing on the sea train, and we have 7th Avenue jammed solely. Thank you, There sir. is no more to go. Thank you, sir. The chip played by Carter Thompson. You have 45 seconds, sir. Given the recent record of our current city administration, I would not suggest those guys get authority to implement any new taxes. As for development, they've created a culture of animosity. They're making things very difficult for any development or business growth to happen due to complicated policies and plain old high taxes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If there are no other chips, that marks the halfway point. We're gonna take a 10 minutes intermission, which means we'll start in 15 minutes because you've all done this before. So. <laughs> Please take 10 minutes, look at your clock, I'm looking at mine. We will start again at uh, quarter to nine, okay? That's 8.45, we shall start again, and we will be prompt, thank you. All right, shall we begin again? We're gonna return to our crowdsource questions so our candidates know there are four more of those crowdsource questions. Count up your tokens, know how many poker chips you have left, choose to use them wisely. There will also be what we call the how round after the second question. I'll explain that when we get there. But we're going to return now to our questions. And this go, the first question goes to first Milan Pepez and then Nahid Nenshi. Here is the question. Where do you stand on the cosmetic use of pesticides in Calgary? That's our crowdsource question. Where do you stand on the cosmetic use of pesticides in Calgary? Mr. Pepez, would you like to start? <laughs> this is a, a kind of a situation, you know, we should stay away from the pesticides. We have lots of uh, negative uh, chemicals used by the city across the every day and uh, we also have our industry polluting our land, and we have a children, and especially when children will come together with the pesticides, they are liable to develop diseases which are hard to treat. And I don't think so we need to use a pesticide. I would ban 
all the chemicals which are danger to the health because we can't get away without it. Uh, at one time, uh, a city was using pesticides in extreme large amount. I welcome that the situation has changed and chemicals are not used as much as they used to be. But uh, even the uh, small amount of any chemical which is dangerous to your health uh, shouldn't be uh, implanted into the, our land because we never know what we gonna, where we're going to move this land or where, what we're going to grow on. Thank you, sir. Mr. Nenci. Thank you. Uh, back in 2010, uh, prior to being elected mayor, I spent a long time talking to a lot of folks on all sides of this issue, including uh, some very good scientific research from the Canadian Cancer Society. And I said at that time that I was in favor of strongly reducing, uh, stringently reducing the use of pesticides, particularly for cosmetic purposes here in the city. Now, I will tell you that one of the things that surprised me about being in this job is the number one issue that people call my office about. It's not taxes, it's not transit, it's dandelions. And we are, in fact, in a world where we've got this integrated pest management strategy, um, which is working well, but could be better on city-owned land. We haven't been able to yet get to a point where people are able to use non-pesticide um, solutions on their private land as much as I would like. I would like great, uh, much more adoption of pesticide-free yards, of natural plantations in these yards, and we need to do a better job in parks as well. We need to do a better job in parks maintenance in general, and there are a number of ways that we need to look at that, but in particular in ensuring that um, sporting fields, playing fields, and so on remain completely free of weeds that can be dangerous uh, to people who are playing on them, and that our parks are naturalized and reduce the use of chemicals, but remain places that people can enjoy. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jackman, it sounds like you went all in there with the chips. Chemicals. <laughs> you have so uh, no, no, no. You have at least forty-five seconds. Really, what we what we got here is pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers. Uh, a lot of this stuff isn't required. Uh, we're using calcium to uh, melt snow and ice. Uh, I walk with my favorite nephew, as I call him, Stanley. He's 110-pound Rhodesian Ridgeback. Uh, he wears boots in the wintertime. He's lost all his toenails. His boots get saturated with this slush, this gray slush the city puts down before the uh, event. And then, of course, we get to walk in the orange uh, salt. I think that Stanley's nails aren't going to be the same, and I worry about pollinators and other creatures and ourselves. Uh, All right. It's intolerant. That's the clock. Now, you did play two chips. Did you want to go for another 45 seconds? So I'll have one. No. Thank okay. You. <laughs> oh, then you're good. And we're done. Next question. Thank you. Oh, we have another one. Sorry, Norm. Go ahead. Norm Perot. Herbicides and pesticides are different. Herbicides, why don't we make uh, lots of salads out of dandelions and dandelion wine? As far as uh, pesticides, like mosquitoes, things like that, a black light this high above a body of water, and you just put a few drops of soap in it, it, gets, it uh, kills the retentive surface on the water, and mosquitoes sink and drown. If you have one of these overnight when they're in mosquito season, you'll have a sludge this thick, millions of mosquitoes in it. I grew up out in the Badlands without electricity or anything, and I know so many ways of curing these problems. Again, if you want to know how to build roads, ask a trucker. Thank you, you want to know how to get rid of problem, pesticides, herbicides, ask a guy that knows. Thank you, Mr. Perot. <laughs> Any other chips? All right. Uh, interestingly, this next question goes to Norm Perot and Bruce Jackman. So here's the question. What is your stance on the city's curbside recycling plan? Would you extend the plan to include recycling of organics and plastics? Why or why not? And we start with Norm Perot. What we're getting is 
way too much of these bins that are out in the front street making Calgary look like a garbage dump. They got rid of back alleys so that they could concentrate more houses, higher taxes in, in a smaller area. Now, why not go back to, or keep the, the, the blue bins and the black bins, but don't add to it. Anybody that's cutting grass or, or these other things that they want, mulch, whatever, why don't they just have a place where they can be taken so you don't have these bins all winter long waiting for one or two uses or five uses in the summertime of recycled grass. Again, common sense. Thank you, Mr. Perot. Mr. Jackman, give a minute now. Well, curbside recycling, uh, garbage pickup is required, it's true. So we got two cans instead of one and we're actually uh, recycling, that's a good thing. Now, the organic part, uh, that'll be a third can. A lot of people that do already uh, do their composting like their own product. I don't think they're going to want to pay to have their product uh, what we call raw material taken away and produced back into some product that's questionable and buy it back. So we got to pay for it twice or plus another box in the back alley. Um, what we're doing so far is good, but I also see we have a study going on for these high density uh, buildings, condos, apartment buildings and stuff. Uh, three years I've been using boxes and three years these people are just filling the landfill site. Uh, What's the study about? Like, other cities do this. Do we have to pay somebody $100,000 a year to study something repetitively and have no action? And that's why I'm running for mayor. There's <laughs> just so many studies, not enough action. And same with my managers, where I work. It's like, slough off the work, give it to the new engineer. And then, well, eight months later, oh, another new guy, give it to him. Uh, this costs money, this is unproductive. Uh, recycling I like, but the organics, no. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Jackman. I heard a chip. John Lord. Thanks, well, one of the ways that you save money is to anticipate problems before they happen. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. When I was on council, they bragged about the 100-year supply of landfill that Calgary has. Well, in my view, those landfills are an environmental disaster waiting to happen, and sometime in the next 50 years or 100 years, we'll probably have to dig them up to mitigate at enormous cost. So I studied Halifax in places that recycle 70% of their solid waste stream instead of Calgary at the time, about 15 to 20%. And I advocated for modern technology, which you don't have to source separate. It goes into a plant, it's separated mechanically, it produces electricity and it makes a profit. Why Time. can't we do that? Thank you. I hear another chip. Go ahead. Well, here it's me again, and I have a problem here with Quarry Park. Uh, anybody notice they're building a mountain of garbage in the middle of the city? Uh, what's the deal with that? Like, we have public landfill sites. Right in the middle of a brand new development, Quarry Park, we have a mountain of garbage. Who authorizes this stuff? Like, who's doing the thinking here? <laughs> Did I hear another chip? Was there another chip? No. All right, you're out of chips. Thank you, Mr. Jack. All right, let's move to the how round. You may have forgotten what the how round is all about, and I'll tell you. Uh, this is another round of quick questions. You can put your coins away, those you have them left, because you can't use them during this round. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to provide specifics in a small brochure or on a website that you want to ensure is not too wordy. This is your chance to provide details, and that's why it's called the How Round. We have previously visited your website or read one of your brochures or talked to you about your uh, priorities. Each candidate will be given 30 seconds to tell us exactly how you plan to accomplish this goal. Please be as specific as possible. Avoid giving any background as to why this goal is important. This is the, this, uh, sorry, this is the time for details. That's what we want to hear. All right, here we go. Oh yes, and you've got 30 seconds. Did I mention that? 
So, starting with the details and starting with our how round questions, we'll begin with Bruce Jackman as we work our way through. Bruce, you said, you told us, your top issue is, quote, getting the 37th Avenue interchange built. It's 37th Street, but that's correct. Southwest Thank you. Calgary. 37th uh, Street. All right. We've needed that connector for quite a while. It's been on the books. I used to ride my motorcycle out there when I was a kid. We used to snowmobile on the reservoir. Times have changed, but one thing has not changed. We need 37th Street. It would be a tunnel, a bridge, and a tunnel. I would ask Peter Many Wounds of the Ticina Nations if we could borrow a little bit of property, not buy, borrow just for boulevard and aesthetics. And we would have radar control, patrol there would be uh, 60K, and they would issue hmm. the tickets. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next question goes to Carter Thompson. Mr. Thompson, your website says, quote, I can bring real life business experience, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> and will use resources available to encourage more business in Calgary. If elected, how will you do this? There's so many things that we can do together where we can partner business with, uh, with community initiatives, with our arts <clears throat> programs, with music. A lot of the driver can be business, so if we, the more we can team up and generate some revenues outside of the city having to cough up the bucks for everything, I think that we can make it better for everybody in a lot of aspects. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. <clears throat> John Lord, you're next. You told us your top issue is, quote, the cost of living that's being driven by bad decisions, unquote. If elected, how will you address this? Well, I think education is a really good start right off the bat. What type of decisions are we making and what are going to be the unintended consequences and how is that going to be driving costs up? The costs of City Hall have gone up almost, almost triple at this point from when I was on council uh, only a short time ago. How could that possibly have happened? The city hasn't grown anywhere near that much. So let's get into smarter spending which is basically specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. Let's start watching the pennies, which I've done my whole life as a small right. businessman, <clears throat> and that's how we're going to do it. Thank you, sir. Jonathan Sundstrom. Thank you. You told us <laughs> transparency at City Hall is your top issue. If elected, how will you address this? Well, I really think, I know there's been many conversations in regards to uh, freedom of information and what have you not. We can't make any informed decisions unless we actually have side-by-side -side comparisons. Even this argument right now with the home developers and the subsidies, and it is a subsidy, not a subsidy. Well, we're talking about numbers here, and a person cannot make an informed decision unless they actually have the information in front of them. However, there's also barriers. 311, whatever else. Um, short story was I went to a city public meeting, it was cancelled, or sorry, the people left early, and uh, three years later, still no answer. So just the information needs to be readily available. Thank you, Mr. Sunstrom. I appreciate it. it's a tough timeline. Larry Heather, you're next. Your website says, quote, while Calgary, is, or, <laughs> while Calgary is ahead of some cities in Canada in the way the budget and financial documents are reported in a multi-year model, some definite improvements are in order, unquote. So if elected, how will you do this? One of the problems we have with the budget is there's two different systems of accounting used. One for the budget, which is a cash accounting, and one for the financial reports that uh, record the spending of the budget. That's accrual accounting. Now these should be harmonized both to accrual accounting, but that means that we're getting a much better basis. Another problem is the aggregation of departments is different from the budget than it is in the reports. So let's say you say fire, police, et cetera, mm. on the budget, and then on the report it, it says, and? it says uh, protective services. That's Thank it. you, sir. So. Milan Pepez, you're next. Your website says, quote, Deerfoot Trail and Crowchild Trail are parking lots 
and every street is a traffic jam, unquote. If elected, how will you address this? I guess this is an issue of the missing funds from province and federal government, which were promised to the Calgary in late 70s and early 80s to develop a substantial transit system for the Calgary. And we have failed to continue because of the government cuts, and we need to develop Sea train lines, at least single line to the Airdrie and to Okotox or to uh, Cochrane, so we limit the amount of the cars coming on the, these streets. We don't need these cars there. That's it. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Nenshi, your website says, quote, whether you live in the inner city or in a brand new suburban development, you want your neighborhood to be a great place to live with the services and amenities you and your family need. All right, if elected, how will you do this? 30 seconds. <laughs> Here we go. Um, we have to invest upfront in the kinds of things that make new neighborhoods livable and design them from the ground up to be mixed in use, to have recreation and shopping close to home, to not rely only on the vehicle. And the newest neighborhoods that we're building in the city, the newest neighborhoods that this council has approved for 200,000 people accomplish that. We spent a lot of money on the community infrastructure fund in order to start backfilling some neighborhoods that are already built with these kinds of things like rec centers and libraries, but the built form and making sure that different kinds of people can live in the same neighborhood is essential to make that happen. That was 33 seconds. <clears throat> Mr. Perot, in your brochure you say, quote, the devastating impact of overtaxation of seniors is not only driving them out of Calgary, they now have to decide if they can pay for medications, food, and max, or property tax bills. If elected, how will you address this? Well, to start out with, uh, I'd try to get the seniors that moved out of Calgary because of the high cost, they moved to High River and they get hit with a flood. We could bring them back, and if we were to uh, spend some of the uh, money that is being wasted um, and I don't know where it's going, like 250 or 280 million that was um, used when it, when it sold the fiber optics division on NMAX. I don't know where that money went. That could be used. Thank you, sir. And so that was the how round. We're now going to return to our crowdsource questions. There are two remaining. We're down to the last two due to time and for fairness. Following that, there will be your closing statements. So, this next question goes to Carter Thompson and to Larry Heather. Here's the question, starting with Carter Thompson. If elected, how will you repair flood damage public infrastructure and strengthen Calgary's flood mitigation policies and infrastructure? Mr. Thompson. I believe that flood mitigation strategies are already available. This will need to be reviewed and taken into account, especially when addressing the current infrastructure or new development. Building codes will need to be reviewed, and during our approval processes, any new buildings that we want to build have to ensure that they're above grade and an acceptable level to withstand that 100-year flood. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Larry Heather, yes, your, your turn, one minute, 30 seconds. First of all, we need to seriously consider dredging the two Bow Rivers, the Elbow and the Bow. The, the, bank, the uh, bed is extremely shallow, especially on the Elbow. Now, along the riverbanks also, we need to redesign our houses to be on a pillar system, that your movable assets go into the bottom, your cars, your boats, or whatever, and your other assets, including the electrical box, up on the level. Now, in a flood, these are evacuated and they become mini dry ponds in which water is stored and takes water away from the groundwater seepage and then released back into the river on a graduated basis as the river can take it. Um, as far as dredging the uh, Glenmore Dam to increase the capacity, 
There is, uh, I hope we do archaeology work on, I think, is it John Ware's ranch down there? Or one, one of the founding fathers' ranch is under that. Uh, so I hope they do that first, but we can look at dredging the Glenmore Dam as well. And look, face it, folks, people are not going to stop living by the river. So let's design houses that accommodate the 24 hours or the 48 hours where that property is flooded and then get back to living in Calgary. The whole downtown is on a floodplain. We're going to move the whole downtown? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Did I hear? I heard a, was that a chip? You're playing your... Uh, security. <laughs> Mr. Nenshi, you had a chip. So two, the two, there was a two-part question. The first is, how are we going to pay for it? And it's important to recognize that in every single disaster that we've seen in the history of this province, despite the best efforts of the federal government, the provincial government, and insurance companies, there is always 10% to 20% left over at the end that the city needs to cover, which is why I do believe it was a no-brainer to use the $52 million tax surplus in this year to cover that. And by the way, we spent about $50 million of it already on things like waiving landfill fees and property tax penalties for flood-impacted people. In terms of mitigation, it's time to think big. The stuff in the mountains is a no-brainer, and I'm really interested in spending time with our expert panel and the province's expert panel, both of which will report by the end of the year, on diversion tactics within Calgary. Some of them sound like science <clears throat> fiction right now, but if they work, it sounds time. like it's the right thing to do. Thank you, sir. Yep. Norm Perot played his last chip. You have 45 seconds. Actually, uh, like I had mentioned before, uh, I had predicted the flood, how to mitigate it. Now, again, talk to someone who's tuned in with nature. Short of that, we could take the uh, money that is in all these backroom deals that could be used to buy a whole pile of canoes for the people that are downtown. Wouldn't that be a common sense thing? Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Go ahead, sir. Mr. Pepez played his uh, chip. Go ahead. I personally believe that uh, city, province, totally failed uh, in prevention of the floods because in the 70s, provincial government established basically the law that nobody's going to build in the floodplains, and everybody from the floodplains will be relocated, and that was broken. If we would uh, follow these orders, we wouldn't have this damage of $6 billion, and also we should stop today all the development in floodplains in Calgary. We're still building in Bridgeland, we're still building in Sunnyside and East Village. Next flood may happen even tomorrow, because if we get the snow in the mountains, rain, we get flat and no Thank water. You, sir. Thank you very much. All right. No other chips. We'll move to our final question. This question goes to Jonathan Sundstrom and John Lord. The question is, starting with Mr. Sundstrom, what would a diverse economy in Calgary look like? for you, what will you do or have you done to achieve that? Mr. Sundstrom. That's an interesting question. What would a diverse economy, okay. I suppose that part of the city's role would be to provide a, a, an economy that's a little bit more diverse. Um, I'm just trying to visualize how that would actually interact with people day by day. Uh, say, for example, the food trucks could be construed as something that would be a bit of a diverse economy. We do have lots of different places, spaces that either predicated upon zone or otherwise could add some commercial aspect to it. Um, so we run less than a, my, or if I take time off here, I can uh, finish sooner. Um, but honestly, I'm a little bit flummoxed, so rather than uh, go on babbling on, I will pass it over and... Uh, Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Hmm. Mr. Lord, would you like me to repeat the question? No, actually, uh, I've done a lot of work on this one, and I'm perfectly prepared. 
a diverse economy in Calgary. What have I done about that? What would it look like? You know, we are blessed here in Calgary to have people from uh, about 180 countries around the planet. I mean, what a resource, because your people are always your best resource, and we have such a diverse population here. Imagine if we can utilize that resource, harness that talent to start doing business globally all over the planet, right, right out of Calgary. And what is one way we could do that? Telework. That's why I introduced it in 1998. I said, a huge opportunity here ahead of the curve to get people doing business globally on their computers, right out of Calgary. And I think Calgary kids are actually some of the best educated, most skilled people on the planet. I don't want to import all this talent from elsewhere to come here. You grow your economy through exporting. I want Calgary kids to be the best in the world, the best they can be, and start moving and traveling because they're in demand everywhere, and that's going to bring it back to Calgary. That's what's really going to create a diverse economy. And most importantly, we've got to stop clobbering small businesses in this town with, a, with enormous, outrageous taxes, ruinous taxes. That's how you build an economy. It's coming from small businesses. 80% of new wealth, new job creation, it's all the innovation that small business brings to the table, and that's what we've got to stop doing, is clobbering our small business sector. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lund. So we saw two chips played. So the first one was Mr. Sundstrom, and then I believe we go down to Mr. Heather. 30, 45. I thought since I finished that last one off uh, so spotty, uh, very good points here, John. I agree with a lot of that. Um, the one question pertaining to what, what or should, could a person do here? My little, I'm not trying to sell or tout this, but my little gallery downtown, I've actually invited many different artists at different times with a lot of them saying, geez, this would be a lovely place to do some retail sales or otherwise. Now, I do have to go through the bylaw process to find out exactly what is or isn't allowable, but I, I have seen over the years plenty of those kind of spaces that could be utilized, even on a short-term basis. Um, a good example here, we all know where a Crack Mac is downtown, or so they call it on 8th Street and uh, 7th uh, Avenue. And yet the city's got a property there that's all boarded up for future development of the park, as far as I understand, and it's not being utilized. Those type of underutilization of assets drive me crazy. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Mr. Heather, you're next. John has already made the reference to businesses being taxed up to five times that of residential. This is killing our businesses, especially the downtown with the restricted parking. Uh, our relationship to MDs is also... A, uh, pertinent. The mayor of Calgary should foster cooperative and helpful alliances with the surrounding municipal districts around Calgary. A petty or jealous competitiveness hurts Calgary and to the detriment of the welfare of the surrounding commuters who work in and contribute to the economy of Calgary. Calgary tourism, foster a tourism awareness of events happening in southern Alberta. What makes southern Alberta strong makes Calgary so strong because we are the transportation hub. Thank you, And sir. we need to uh, do that. Mr. Nenchi. Three years ago, I stood up here and said that we needed to make Calgary the best place in Canada to start and grow a business. So Mr. Lord may think that businesses are leaving in droves. In fact, that's not true at all. Calgary remains one of the few places in the world where the business sector is growing, where unemployment is not our primary concern. We have the highest number of small businesses per capita anywhere in Canada. We have the highest number of startups per capita anywhere in Canada. So if small business is fleeing our city, I don't know where they're going because in fact, they're all coming here. We weathered the financial crisis in 2008 better than just about anywhere in the world, and that's largely because we've, received, we've achieved critical mass of a diverse economy here. We need to continue to attract people to this country, to this city. We need the very best engineers and artists in the world to say, I want to live there, I want to work there, I want to invest there, and I want to raise a family there, and that's what I've been working on for three Thank years. You, all right. Time now for closing statements. Is everyone ready for their closing statement? We went from right to left when we opened up. We're going to go from left to right to finish off, which means we will start with Carter Thompson. You have one minute, sir. Like you, people, a regular citizen of Calgary, I'm frustrated with increased taxes and no benefit to the people of Calgary. I want to focus on some important things for our city. First of all, when I'm elected mayor, I will donate $100,000 of my salary per year to local charity. 
I will implement policies and processes that are business friendly. I will reduce pressures at choke points on the major arteries of our town. I will work hard to improve transit, improve the crosstown routes so that we can get around this city much more efficiently. I'm going to get the city out of the taxi business and open it up to free enterprise. The city will be a regulatory body only. I will address environmental concerns. I will reduce congestion. I will plant more trees. I will allow community gardens in low-used areas and park areas. My focus will be on the necessities of Calgarians. I will not focus time on resources, on things we don't need, like expensive pedestrian bridges, shark's fin soup ban, and shutting down major arteries for a party on Sunday. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Jonathan Sundstrom, one minute. The, 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 just to close the statement, okay. Yeah. Um, I don't harbor any notion or delusion that I'm going to be elected mayor of this city. I basically participated in this for, for the very specific aspect of some dialogue to discuss things that are going to be coming up over the next four years. That it would be the new arena. That would be whether or not we should take a look at Edmax and whether or not we should sell it. That's a personal opinion there. I do have to say, though, I'm quite surprised when Jonathan Joseph Lord showed up. I would swear it's a conspiracy for Mayor, or our previous Mayor, Nenshi, to steal the campaign from me by confusing the electorate. Jonathan, John Lord's name is actually Jonathan Joseph Lord also. Anyways, what I'm trying to do here is stimulate some uh, dialogue, discourse, discussion, just so we can find out what the reason, rhyme, and rationale of why we do certain things, and when we do things, how the policy, procedure, and protocol all works. But without that information being readily available, you have to trust your counselors that they're giving you the straight goods. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Norm Perot. I started Western Framing and Finishing over 40 years ago. I know a little bit about small business. If you want to get the real facts, not mendacious statements, phone small businesses like Bowness Auto Parts and ask them. Phone the small businesses. You'll get the straight goods from them. Now, um, if I'm elected mayor, there will be a lot of things that get done. That's what I've done all my life. I've had calluses on my hands for over 55 years. I'm a doer, not a talker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pro. So if I would be elected, I would be first issue, the most important issue, we have 10,000 people with schizophrenia in Calgary without any medication, without doctor and uh, treatment. And these people cannot function in our society without the medication. So they live in extreme pain. So I would eliminate that pain by lobbying the both governments, provincial and federal government, provide the medication for them. Secondly, I would uh, lobby the governments, provincial and federal, to establish adequate and coordinated weather and climate monitoring in the mountains, provide a safety for citizens of Calgary in the coming next flood. This is the only way we can control it and prevent it. And third, I would look to make sure that we have mandated uh, control over the trail uh, coming through the city because of the potential accidents, and they are happening, seven in last year. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Not hitting at you. Three years ago, I was given an incredible opportunity. The opportunity to go to work every single day and serve the citizens of this city to try and make this place even better. And I'm proud of what we've accomplished. I'm proud of the work that we've done in areas like changing the management at City Hall, making it more citizen-centered, in planning for transit in the future, in all those things that we've done just to make life a little bit better every single day for everyone who lives here. But we have a remarkable opportunity ahead of us, a remarkable opportunity to elect a mayor and a council who share that vision of an even better Calgary, of an even better mobility system, of even better government, of even better community, and a place that we can grow even better. We have that chance. And I hope our voter turnout is just as high as it was in 2010, and I hope Calgarians take that pencil between their thumb and their forefingers and vote for that Calgary that they want. 
It's been an honor, it's been a humbling honor to serve for the last three years, and I hope I have the opportunity to serve Calgarians for four more. Thank you, sir. John Lord. You have one minute, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, to be truly great, a city has to be affordable for everyone. And I don't know how a 31% tax increase is making it an even better city. It's making it much less affordable. And what I'm going to do is keep my commitment to you, if elected as mayor, to make the city more affordable, to do more with less, to put a lid on taxes, to create a better environment for small business, and to create all that affordable housing that we could be creating here if we weren't spending so much money at City Hall and doing all these social engineering experiments that had good intentions but are having unintended consequences that will virtually bankrupt this city and bring our economy dramatically down for a generation going forward. And so that's my commitment to you, is we will do more with less, we will do much better, and I will deliver on what we need to do as a city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lord. Bruce Jack. Well, thank you, Civic Camp, and everybody that's here, all the attendees. It's been great here to talk to you and get my points across. I will promise one thing. I've, I've read the job description. I'm happy with the wage. That will not be the first thing we discuss or raise in City Hall. And I'm also going to take it to the union tomorrow, the union I represent, that uh, I'm going to take zero for four years. I'm going to ask the council to do the best to match that. And I'm going to go all of our unions and ask for zero for the first year of, of my tenure as mayor. And we will make improvements and adjustments with management that improve our services without costing more money. The $52 million is apparently already in the bank. So that's not to be discussed. I would like to bring in a zero tax increase for my first year. Thank you. Yes. Larry Heather, one minute. My wanted poster takes both darts and flowers. Uh, it's available up here. In the coming four years, you will want a mayor who will clear the deck for Calgary's natural resources sector to flourish in a competitive environment. We do not need the self-cutter abuse of the alarmist greenhouse gas report in our city. Let's hear from a prominent fundraiser at an Annie Oil Sands banquet recently. Clean energy use to Pemima means the elimination of fossil fuels. I hope you realize that. This is the and evidence, Your time, Honor. Sir. Uh, is the jury out? And that brings our forum to a close. Uh, before we all go, uh, candidates, I know you'd like to express your thanks to all those not only in the room, but those on television and online who watched this evening's forum. It was great to have such a great turnout. So on behalf of all of you, I will say thanks to them. Thank you to the organizers and to all of you. This is a chance to thank your candidates. Let's give them a round of applause. Good night, and don't forget to vote.